Hello, and thanks for checking out ChartGuys.com. We're proud to be one of the most successful technical analysis communities online, teaching you the skills to become a more confident, effective, and informed trader. Join our community of hundreds of analysts worldwide working together to learn the charts, generate profit, and achieve financial independence. For access to daily live chart analysis and market coverage, a thriving chat community, along with dozens of hours of exclusive educational materials. We look forward to seeing you. Let's check out some charts. Hey everyone, checking in on the broader market. So before we get into it, got to touch a little bit on the civil unrest we've got going on in the US. I know we have a lot of Canadian viewers and Australian viewers and people around the world who don't necessarily know exactly what's going on and see all the images. And obviously the S&P 500 doesn't care, so we can get that out of the way. Right now, the market does not care about this civil unrest whatsoever. In my opinion, I'll explain why I think that is just a little bit. Obviously, we know the Fed is pumping the market. It didn't really care much about COVID after the initial shock. But I want to separate myself before sounding insensitive because human being Dan is not the same as Trader Dan. Trader Dan doesn't have any emotions. I completely cut that off. And all I care about is how does this impact the market? I don't care about, you know, the major big picture things. Human Dan, obviously, I care about the tragedy that took place and the systemic racism that we have that, that goes all the way down the line through the system, whether it's for-profit prisons, mandatory minimum drug sentences for people that like certain kinds of plants that the government doesn't like. Its, it's roots are very deep. So all that aside, why do I think the market is not reacting to the civil unrest? And this is my opinion that is not really worth a whole lot, but I do have experience with some large scale protests back in the Occupy days. I went to eight different cities and slept out on the streets with everybody and experienced the Occupy movement firsthand through a lot of different experiences. And what I get, my takeaway from that, as I am paying attention and watching these live streams every night, and just a little side note, look up Google woke Twitch, you, uh, woke, woke Twitch protest, and you'll probably get a good link, but woke on Twitch does a good job of putting up like nine different live streamers around the country and someone is there monitoring it where some action is happening. They'll, they'll make that screen a bit bigger. They'll turn up the volume on that screen. They do a really good job of just allowing you to watch everything and then zooming in when there's action going on. But from those observations, in my opinion, and having dealt with and watched militarized police before, at no point in time have I seen the militarized police lose control. Every single time they have wanted control, they have gotten it. Yes, there are stores being looted. Yes, there are some cars being burned here and there. But when the militarized force wants control, they get it. We're not, or we're not seeing organized protesters go up against the militarized police with an intent to take them down. We're not seeing widespread use of gas masks and, and you know barricades and shields and clubs by protesters. For the most part, we definitely have, whether it's alt-right, far left, from both sides. They are definitely instigators on both sides. The majority of people are not interested in that. And because of that, when the militarized police want control, they get it. And that's what I've been observing. That could change. Things could escalate, but that's my observation for now. And the market is affirming to me that that is the case. So we'll con continue to monitor it and keep an eye on the situation, but it's pretty un under control as far as I'm concerned. And I understand that people might think that sounds crazy, bigger picture. That's just my opinion. So spy on the daily time frame. We've got a higher low at 299.47. We have the highest close on the entire COVID bounce. We did have a little double top at the high of the day today and a little bit of profit taking into the close. But if you zoom out to the hourly time frame, we're just looking for an hourly higher low to form. And at this point, it is possible that that is an hourly bull flag. As far as the resistance goes, we just have 306.84, the top of the COVID bounce. If that breaks, we're looking back at 308.47 and then 313.84 as the next major resistance level from there. If we look at the S&P 500 futures chart, we had a nice tightening hourly pattern that broke bullish. We are now back testing that downtrend resistance line that did break bullish. And here are the bulls trying to back test and hold it and see continuation. So we were watching this pattern this morning and it broke bullish. So full steam ahead for the bulls for now. And what stands out the most to me is the continued tag team action that I've been talking about from these sectors. On Friday, who was our strongest sector? 
the healthcare sector. Who was weakest? The financial sector. Today, who was strongest? The financial sector. Who was weakest? The healthcare sector. Literally swapping places. And again, the analogy I used is the tug of war where the leader of the tug of war in the most important position, which I'm is told now is in the back, gets tapped on the shoulder and moves and someone takes their space. And that's what we're seeing with these sectors keeping each other strong. IWM, daily higher low is set at 136.41. The bulls would have to break 144.74 for continuation. That's a bit of a ways away. We did pull back fairly significantly. We could be watching for a four hour equilibrium. High, low, let's see if we set a lower high. And if we do, we'll be watching 136.41 as a key support level. If that level breaks, yes, we can confirm a daily downtrend, but we have to fail to break resistance and drop down and break the low of Friday for that to be the case. And that's the same for XLF. Daily higher low is set. We had the three gap up open big bull move. We had healthy daily consolidation for the higher low to be set at 23.17. We have key resistance of 24.34. We have the four hour. Don't like it as much on the four hour. But the daily chart would have to top out with the inability to break 2362 and then fall back and break the low of Friday, 2317, for the bears to take some short-term momentum. Tech sector, very strong. Highest close of the COVID bounce. Resistance was 23360. We broke that level. We're at the high of the COVID bounce. Anything above 22394 keeps the bulls strong. Close at the high of the day, three of the last four days. Six of the last... Nine days, tech sector is strong still. Healthcare. So healthcare is a daily inside bar. Again, lead bull on Friday. And we did break to a higher high on Friday. Again, hit the high of the COVID bounce. If this inside bar breaks bullish, that strength continues. If it breaks bearish, the bulls have to form a daily higher low compared to 98.07. Bottom line, bulls still have control. Biotech sector, XBI. Watching this tightening four hour range here, a little bit more clear, where we have the low of last week, high of the bounce, higher low, double top. If we reject from that level and pull back into tomorrow, we'll look for a higher low compared to $100, but it's a nice tightening four hour range to be watching for now. Watch the semiconductor sector. It's going to break soon. This pattern tells me that a spike in volume and volatility is coming very soon. We saw low volume across the board today in the markets. We know the S&P 500 bulls do not need volume to go up. We learned that in 2016, 2017, and beyond. And today was a perfect example. But SMH, inside bar, inside bar. If it breaks bullish, we're going to test 142.14, the high of the COVID bounce. If it breaks bearish, the most important support for me is 135.65. Watch the semiconductor space, names like AMD. We're watching for a tightening daily range on AMD, which is already well into a weekly tightening range. We know NVDA has been a blue sky bull, but we're watching for the potential of a lower high on NVDA compared to the all-time high. Semiconductors are going to be interesting the second half of this week, if not sooner. The VIX. So the VIX is just constantly giving us these lower highs for six weeks. 40.30, 39.30, 31.60, And we're looking down at the low of 25.90. So we're still in a base formation pattern. We're still tightening up. And we're watching for a break very soon. Either a drop back down to support or a big bull move up to try and break these daily lower highs. But as of right now, the bear is still very comfortable as long as daily lower highs is what we continue to see. Gold. So gold, we are looking at 1754 resistance. Anything under that is a daily lower high, but the size of the bounce on the daily time frame at this point, certainly significant enough to be looking for a higher low once we top out. Four hour uptrend is our guide. We set a higher low this morning on the four hour chart. When we lose the four hour uptrend, my beer's getting sunny and warm. When we form a lower high, when we lose the four hour uptrend, our daily lower high will be set. I personally exited my GLD swing back here. And if we pull back and form a higher low, I will happily re-enter. Why would I happily re-enter? Because when I exited here, the nearest support on the daily time frame was 1692. And that was 
$35 away. If I scale in for a daily high or low, my support level is going to be $16.94 and it's going to be closer. So I would love to see a daily lower high compared to that level, a pullback and a higher low. Why am I not interested in entering silver, which has been much stronger than gold? Absolutely. And shout out to the people who were looking at silver before this big catch up move took place. But the reason I am not interested now in silver is because we are looking for a monthly higher low on the XAU XAG chart. We pulled back significantly and the daily RSI is crushed. And I'm expecting a short-term bounce to shift momentum. And I'm expecting gold to gain against silver sooner rather than later. The time to choose silver over gold that I missed was right here. And I do have some long-term physical silver positions, but right here on the confirmed weekly downtrend, that was the time to ditch gold and go silver. And I missed it. And that's how it goes. And that's okay. Silver. Bull break on the daily, breaking out. We know anything above 1685 is a daily higher low. The four hour chart is attempting a bull flag here. $18 is four hour support. Resistance is 1839. And then after that, 1895 is the most important resistance. Don't lose sight of the monthly time frame because anything under 1895 is a monthly lower high. And that is why I initially chose gold because gold is a much stronger long-term chart. That's gold's monthly chart. Where's the lower high? Pretty much the all-time highs. One resistance level, then the all-time highs, whereas silver has way more. Silver to get back to all-time highs is like 150%. Gold is like 8%. Something, those are very rough numbers, but it's something like that. Miners. Watching for a lower high compared to 37.49. I would love to see a gap up open in miners tomorrow for them to get overextended to be looking for a bearish entry on miners anticipating that a lower high is the most likely scenario. So anything under 37.49 is a lower high. If we do get a bit more follow through for the bulls, we got our high, low, lower high, and we'll look for a higher low and tightening range. So with that setup tomorrow, I'm watching dust. And I'm watching to potentially play off of Dust's low, keeping in mind that Dust can break $25 support before the bull miners break their resistance. Why? Because Dust is a leveraged DTF with time decay. So if I'm using stop losses, I am using the GDX high as my stop, not $25 on Dust. And again, it would have to be ideal conditions for me to take this trade. But if we see a gap down open on these bear miners... I will be watching for it tomorrow. Oil, higher low on the daily set at 31.14, significant bull move into the end of the last week and the bulls are keeping the four hour uptrend in their favor. New four hour higher low 34.27 and testing the high of 35.90. Short term guide of this four hour uptrend was anticipating a four hour equilibrium was gonna be the most likely scenario here. We got a tightening range. I would have liked one more lower high, but Bulls said, nope, big bull volume. We're just going to break out and get that out of the way. Last week, four-hour uptrend is our guide on metals and oil for the short term. Natural gas double bottom with the low of Friday, but the bears certainly have control overall. And as I've said, to keep it simple, as long as the weekly 12-period exponential moving average is resistance, the bears keep full short or midterm control, whatever you want to call it. And that has been constantly rejecting the price for months. So that is where we stand overall. Big day for the Tesla bulls. That's what I was trading most of today in both directions. I think three bullish day, three bullish trades, two bearish trades, all winners, fortunately. Some of them pretty much break even, but swinging a small position with the end of the day momentum. We did break 900 after hours. Tesla volatility. All we were waiting for was a break of this range. I did get shaken out of a swing position on this lower wick from Wednesday, but back in the action and watching for the potential of all-time highs to be in play. So hope you are well. There's tons of volatility out there. Whether we're looking at, I'm about to do a video on gambling stocks and esports stocks that are in euphoria hype mode, whether it's the broader market as a whole, there's individual names going down, individual names going up. This is a great trading environment and 
you know, day traders and swing traders, well, maybe not swing traders, day traders certainly would love for market conditions to always be this way. And that's just not the case. All you got to do is look at SPY. And that's, that's a note. If you are learning how to trade in this environment, environment, it's, don't expect it to be, if you are doing well, congrats, that's great. But don't expect this much volatility because again, all you got to do is look back here and look at what was our daily average range on SPY before the insanity volatility hit. And you're going to be looking at, while we were trading in the 300s, your average range off the top of my head, we're looking at $1 to $2. And maybe it's a little bit more than that, but look at this day here. Low of 319.49, high of 320.25. That is less than $1 range. Our smallest day range that we've seen recently had a range of two and a half dollars. And that's the smallest. Our average is probably four to five dollars. So it's a much different market environment. And as long as this keeps up, it favors day traders because there's tons of volatility. Because if I'm looking for a 1% trade and I have 5% of price action to play within, it's much easier to make 1% with a 5% range than it is to make 1% with a 1% range. And that's just a note on trading as a whole when you're looking at you know, a decade of opportunities. So I hope you're well. Feel free to share your opinion on things. I don't really care about it. If you don't care about my opinion, that's perfectly fine as well. Charts, trading, that's why we're here and that's why this channel exists. Have a good day, do good things, be kind. Planted the ring of flowers here, so those will be nice in a couple of months. All different varieties. Got all these little seeds coming up too. These are coxcomb, which is a very cool kind of flower that stays a flower and a good pollinator late into the season. I always love observing the insects. I've been doing that since I was a little kid. Don't know what's going on here, but I've been watching the ants farm the aphids similar to as humans do with cows, but they protect them, keep them alive, and then they just stroke on the aphid with their antenna, and the aphid secretes a little sugary dew that the ants then eat. So the aphids right now are liking the peas. I've been keeping them off the tomatoes, but they've taken over some spinach, and so there are ants not very far away walking up all over these plants. And it's not a bad thing. It's bad to have the aphids, but Having, plant, having the ants everywhere definitely cuts down on some of the pests. Not sure what these two are doing because that's not an aphid. Lots of little raspberries starting. Unfortunately, the deer have found a fruit tree they like. You can see they pulled off that branch there and they're just eating some of these leaves, so I'll probably have to stake up some kind of little fence to give it a three-foot perimeter. Hopefully they're not too excited about it. Got the grapes going. Baby grapes. 